Due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. Lock your doors. Close the blinds. Change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies. Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This podcast is produced and hosted by Chris Carr. On today's podcast, I'm joined by Lady Jane Reed, and we are discussing a book that she was the translator of called Spy Artist Prisoner, which is all about the Romanian artist George Tomasiu, who became a spy during World War II. I hope you find this episode interesting. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. Jane, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be with you. So, Jane, before we get started, please can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, Well, I'm I'm extremely ancient. I've spent a lot of my career as, well, a lot of my time as a diplomatic wife in various places, but I usually found something interesting to do. And then in interims in London, I taught in comprehensive schools. Then I worked for um, administering a charity and then another charity. And now I'm retired. And I'm nearly 89. Nearly 89. Yep. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> Excellent. Mm. Excellent. Well, I suppose one quick question. What is it like being a diplomat's wife? What kind of experiences do you end up having in that kind of situation? It's very varied. Yeah. Very, very varied. Um, and um, you can involve yourself in the country or not. You can. It's. Uh, it, I, I couldn't sum it up. I and mean, you have to be ready to, to adapt to new people. You, you, if, if you don't develop a, a, a good um, way of liking people and being interested you're lost i think but um mm. i regretted sometimes not having had a career but then i thought um well actually i've done so many interesting things it doesn't it doesn't really you know, i'm compensated yeah mm. yeah today we're going to talk about george tomasio and his biography that you translated called spy artist prisoner so could you just talk to us a little bit about sir george's early life before he became a spy he was born in 1915 so at the outbreak of war he was about 25 and um, he had, um, his father was, um, he was a good family from northern Romania. And his father was a lawyer, but also um, a member of parliament. And um, for, for a thoroughly sort of good party. Um, and uh, George, his interest was always in being an artist. He traveled in the years before the war. He managed to get first to Vienna and then briefly to Paris and around just in early 1939. Uh, he hasn't he hasn't travelled a great deal, but he had studied art and was doing doing well. Mm. His mother's cousin was the um, great composer and violinist George Enescu, and oh, and he was yeah. Enescu's uh, godson as well. So yeah. there were plenty of good connections. Yes, yes. What kind of art did he specialise in? Was this a portraiture or landscapes or a bit of both? Um, it was very much of his own. He was interested in light, mm. and uh, he painted a lot in um, uh, oils. And in the gouache, yeah, I've got two two pictures here in my room by him. A color, 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 and light interested him more than anything else. Yeah. It was vaguely impressionist, I think one could say. Yeah, impressionist influence. Yeah, George talks a little bit about the sort of uh, in the book about the early days of World War Two, and also his feelings of kind of confusion over the non-aggression pact signed between the Soviets and the Nazis. Can you talk to us a bit about sort of those? early years of the war for George and that kind of, that I suppose, that ideological kind of environment at that time? Well, um, sort of in the period before the war, um, it, there was a sort of, it, on the one hand, you had, it, it, Europe was in a mess. On the one hand, looking um, sort of east, you had Russia and communism, which was sort of, um, they, they talked about us as a sort of great hope, hope for humanity and, and um wonderful system and e- equality and chance for all and all the rest. And on the other side, you had the, the uh, fascists who all law and order and, and you know, the good of all because everything was un- under, under control and yeah. so on. Yeah. And you looked from one to the other and, and 
you could see that both in their way were awful and which you would choose. And, and Romania was kind of the pawn stuck between the two systems, really. So it, um, it, and it was a horrible thing to, to grow up with. But he, um, and then to everybody's surprise, these, these totally different um, systems suddenly allied themselves on, onto the, uh, the, the PAX. Which was a shock to everybody. I mean, it was it was um, it was it seemed to be mad. So he was quite conflicted because he he sort of had socialist sort of leanings in his sort of early years, didn't he? And this this pack kind of created a lot of kind of personal confusion for him, didn't it? Well, I think it did for everybody because it, because it had seemed that the two systems were so totally opposed to each other, totally different. Mm. And then suddenly you find well, both awful, but but totally different. And suddenly you find that that they had made an alliance. So it was very, very confusing. Mm. Um, but I don't. I think he 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 mistrusted them both. So he wasn't personally sort of um, hurt by or but did, he didn't feel betrayed because he didn't um, he didn't trust either or support either. So um, it just made the world, the, the world even more weird. Yeah, yeah. And that sort of um, sort of socialistic sort of support for. Soviet Russia is quite interesting. I mean, obviously, we're looking. I, I'm looking back on on the sort of history that we know mm-hmm. about sort of Stalin and things like that. But I suppose at that time, how much of a kind of picture did people really have of Soviet Russia? Because when I'm looking back, it to me sounds dreadful. But for some people, they could have had a rosy eyed view of it. Some people did, yes, because it was um, um, they they managed to sort of proclaim themselves moral and, and equality for everybody and chances for everybody and um, all this kind of thing. I think um, mm. the socialist idea is, is in many ways a very good idea, but it was got hold of by the wrong people. Yeah. I think that's really what it was. And um, at that time, it seemed as if um, even places like Romania was stuck between these two sort of weird ideologies. Anyway, mm. Mm. Yeah, well, no, no, very interesting stuff. It's, it's, yeah, mm. yeah. I mean, like, there's still some people who have a rosy-eyed view of Soviet Russia today, but there we go. Yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> George met a man named Alexander. Beck. It was no chance because he he felt he felt that he had to. Well, he 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 was struck by in nineteen mm. early nineteen forties. He he was uh, the, the horror of the fall of France and the yes. horror of the uh, on all sides total horror, and he, he felt he, he didn't he ought to do something about it. And to begin with, before the fall of France, because his, he, he spoke French as, much, as well as he spoke English, uh, sorry, Romanian, um, and um, his natural affinity was with France. And so he started off doing some, some uh, sort of spying, observation, uh, w- watching, you no know, particularly troop movements and so on, and passing it on to, to, to a couple of French people he knew. But then, of course, with the fall of France, everything became different. Mm. And then he he discovered, in fact, um, this man Eck, whom he had, um, who, who his, his main his boss, so to speak, head of mm. this this spy ring, um, was in fact working for the British. So that's when he he realised, and and he admired Britain at that time, partly because of Churchill, of course, and yes. Churchill's words of defiance. So he was suddenly he found he was working for the British Secret Service, which rather sort of excited him. Yeah, yeah. Seemed very glamorous thing to be doing. Yes, exactly. Well, yeah, British intelligence had a reputation that it very well known by this point. It was even this is pre James Bond as well, but it sort of had this sort of almost mythological sort of status, didn't it? I think so. Yeah, yeah. It was well pre James Bond. Mm. Yeah, and is there anything in the book that he sort of describes at that time? Because I remember uh, with uh, regards to his studying German movements, there's some interesting descriptions about how his sort of art knowledge aided him in being able to kind of track the different types of vehicles and people walking past. Because everybody, it all apparently, it all went through through Bucharest. And so yeah. f- from observing, I, I know, I've never been a spy, so I, I don't know. But uh, uh, observing uh, the yeah. uh, show that, Jacks and badges on on vehicles and so on, mm. and this mm. was throughout his career. Well, yeah, do you want to talk to us about the massacre he, he in Ukraine? Well, um, I mean, he was. It was only sort of as, at the moment itself that he realised what was happening, and you get this sort of picture of the charming German officer who who yeah. comes and plays poker with them and and they um and brings a bottle of, of decent wine every time, good French wine, and um and then um it, and. They haven't. He has no idea of what he's go, being invited to until he actually sees it happen. Um, so, um, 
and the contrast, I mean, the awful, awful contrast of the um, urbane, charming, um, well-mannered, affable uh, German officer and what, mm. he's, what he's having to do and doing without any apparent, um, you know, shame or anything like that. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's a most memorable um, piece of writing. Extraordinary. Yeah, indeed. Mm. Indeed, I've always found that sort of psychologically, that kind of contrast where people could be sort of so nice, but at the same time involved in something so brutal. I've always yeah. found that so fascinating. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's, it's terrifying. It is. One, one other thing that stands out, obviously, with, with that description, obviously the terrible parallels of what's going on in Ukraine at the moment. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, and, the yeah, you're quite absolutely right. It's... Um, uh, it. it, it it doesn't sort of bear. It's it's just going on, and it's it's where it's going to lead and how it's going to end is 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 hard to tell. But the it isn't it isn't ideology which is leading it now. It's mm. it's it's greed, and but it's also um, Russian power and everything else. And interestingly mm. enough, the, the Orthodox Church, which are, mm. the Russian Orthodox Church, with which it even throughout all the communist years, it managed to sort of keep going. Because mm. ordinary people um, believe in it. You know. In in Romania, the author, there was the Romanian Orthodox Church, and um, it kept going. And we we had contacts with the Patriarchate, but and and the, the communists couldn't actually touch it because, in fact, too many people it, um, believed in it. But if you if you wanted to get on in the world, um, you didn't go in anywhere near a church. But if you, if you, if, if, but many people did, and so it survived. Indeed, did you ever anticipate that you would see um, Russia behaving in this way again after the Cold War? No, who could possibly have anticipated this? Really, mm. no. I mean, pretty, pretty, pretty horrible. But um, I've been both to Russia and Ukraine, and and um, mm. but um, yeah, and I think it's Putin. It's a, it's a sort of, but it's um. But one of the holds that communism has on people um, mm. is the very practical one that in a communist in that society it was it was very grim. You couldn't say what you wanted. You couldn't meet people who wanted to. It was all sort of mm. full of fear. But you always had a job. And there was no question. There was no unemployment. Jobs were you might your job was probably listening to telephone calls or something like that. <laughs> and, but, but you know, you always had a job, and um, people, the, the our way of life is more precarious than that kind of way. Can you talk to us about sort of his imprisonment? He was imprisoned by the by the pro-German authorities when he was in the in in the farmhouse in the, in the west of the country, in the east of the country when he was tortured. Um, and that that's when that was the end of the spy ring led by Eck, and Eck went off after that. Yeah. Um, so can you talk to us a bit about that. When he when he realised that he was actually working for the British Secret Service and not yeah. the and uh, not the French Deuxième Bureau, the um, the, the fact was that the, he was part of a group, a, a spy ring, if you like, led by this very strange profess, professor of Byzantology called Alexander yes. Eck. Yes. Um, and um, it was this group was eventually betrayed, and they were all rounded up. And sent off to a, to a, a farmhouse in the country, where the Romanian the Romanian fascist authorities beat them up and and uh, and tried to extract secrets from them. And then suddenly um, the um, it was more or less the end of the war, and they were suddenly let free. And and, and that was really the the end of the end of that. But it was yeah. a particularly horrible um, experience. Yeah, what effect did that have on George? Well, um, I think he was it would intimidated, but not defeated. I think is the answer, really. Yeah, mm. Mm. Um, but he um, um, and everybody hoped at that stage when when the um, Allied troops moved into Romania, people hoped that the king would stay and that things would be um, would would go well and all the rest. But as in in fact. As the war ended and the Allied troops were put out, the, the Russians came in, the communists came in, so there was no, not much respite. Well, let's take a quick break and then we'll be right back.
so after sort of World War Two and Romania fell into the grip of sort of Soviet communism, what would George's sort of feelings of the growth of communism in Romania and how did he react to it? Well, he, his um, um, horror, horror, uh, because um, he uh, it gradually became at the end of the war. Um, mm. the, the, as the Germans moved out, the the the, the um, Soviets moved in, and um, very soon they started sort of um, fixing everything. There, there were there were plenty of people in Romania who who um, were um, intrigued by the well thought thought they had a career uh, as a com- in the communist thing. Uh, but he he saw with horror that the whole of, of the society had had been um, taken over mm. by. Um, by, by people with left wing, very left wing views, and and not only it was Russian authoritarianism. It wasn't merely sort of being being left wing. Obviously, mm-hmm. it was it was the, all that went was Russian communism, and um, and he describes that with the various people he knew who, who who either went along with it or didn't, and and so on. And it was very very uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, and it and it had it was enforced with a kind of uh, you know iron grip from the uh, the authorities, yeah. wasn't it? Yes, if 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 you, you if you sort of expressed views against um, the communist government, you were putting yourself in grave danger, mm. and that's what happened. Can you talk to us about then that that second time he was in prison? So that was in 1950, wasn't it? And it was for 13 yeah. years. What did he sort of experience during that time? It it was um, it was something you just had to sort of endure, and he says mm. he, he describes in great detail the early years of his imprisonment. But then it is well after that, you know, it was all much the same, and and one got used to it, and and um, um, so uh, it was horrific. But you you just sort of you were a prisoner. I suppose it was a psychological mm. effect of uh, of um, uh, be, being a prisoner, and and, and it's awful. I mean, it it was completely utterly horrible. The whole thing. Um, yeah, yeah. Absolutely awful. Yeah, and you you met George then in the latter part in this sort of early this was it the late sixties, wasn't it? You met George, is that right? Yes. Yeah. So can you talk to us about how you got to know him, and I suppose what what um, you know what stood out for you about him as well, and what were you what did you guys sort of discuss? Well, I think that um, we got we got to know him as you say because there was obviously a plan, and um, he and his wife Fraga, whom he married after he came mm. out of prison and they had one child, one son. And he thought him, and, and they were very keen to get out of Romania. At that stage, every Romanian practically uh, was keen on getting out of Romania. And everybody thought that paradise began on the other side of the Iron Curtain, uh, which of course it didn't, but that's what everybody thought. So it was, virt- it was virtually impossible to get out of Romania. Um, then he went to the seaside um, and there were lots of nice beaches and, and people swimming and so on. Never a boat. Never, never a boat of any kind. Not even a rowing boat. Anyway, in case people tried to get away. Um, but um, he um, he and Fraga, uh, together, they must have discussed it and decided that the British owed him a, a, a ticket out of Romania because he had been sent to prison on a charge of spying for the British. Yeah. So... Uh, they must have, before we got there, there must have been discussion and decision that they should be put in touch with Martin and me. Um, and uh, Martin went ahead of me, and then I came sort of in the middle of the summer, and almost the second day I was there, I was invited yeah. to tea by the ambassador's wife, and I took my youngest child, who was uh, less than a year old at the time, and um, we sat on the lawn at the ambassador's house, and um, and Fraga was there with this little boy who was a bit older than Alice. He was about two. And um, we had tea and Fraga explained a little bit of the circumstances mm. and invited us to go and have drinks with them a couple of nights later. So um, it was, it was, it was, uh, they had been, the Tamazi had been lobbying the British embassy, which is incredibly brave of them, but they had done it. <clears throat> and they had done it quite openly. And they were the only Romanians we knew in, in any, and we had been told we would never know any Romanians because they were all too frightened. And and it was these two went. They decided anyway. So we went and then had um, we went to the house they were living, which was owned by a wonderful old lady called Madame Magheru. And um, we 
uh, had drinks on the lawn, and he, he greeted greeted us by saying, "Ah, she filmed for the James Bond." So um, I thought I, I thought of calling the book to begin with and put a James Bond, but I thought <laughs> I, it shouldn't be really in French. Anyway, so it was it was their plan. They they they, they felt that. 13 years in Transylvanian jails um, entitled him to a ticket out of Romania, which only we yes. provide. And that's what it was all about. Um, but in the meantime, we gained enormously from their friendship and, and also, also from the friendship with Madame Aguero, who was a wonderful person. Um, and um, so I have no idea what went on behind the scenes. All I know about the final decision allowing them to leave was that there was um, a visit to the foreign secretary, our foreign, foreign secretary, Michael Stewart at the time. And it was, I think, in the course of that visit that the, the, we were able to somehow persuade the Romanian authorities to allow the Tomatius to leave and go, come, to, come to the West. That's all I know because, you know, I, I wasn't... I, I didn't know anything that went on in official circles. Yeah, yeah. Can you just um, just briefly for the audience, just tell us a little bit about your husband and why he mm -hmm. was in Romania, and why you were both in Romania? Well, he 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 was number two in the embassy there. Yeah, uh, and um, that's why we were there. He was it was a posting, and um, so he, we we were both there, and and our children came and and for holidays and that kind of thing. You know, that was uh, if once you once you had. Become a diplomatic wife. You 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 went where you were sent, yes. and um, that was the, that was our, our our lot. What was it? What was life like for you during that time there? Um, well, if if we had not known the Hamas to our views, our life mm. would have been um, confined to the diplomatic corps, really. Mm. Mm. And um, and somebody told us told me before we went, they had been in Romania, and they say you know it'll be. It is boring as hell because <laughs> you will never meet anybody except members of the diplomatic corps, and because everybody is so aware of protocol, and who is who who you know, dreadful protocol, that probably you will be sitting next to the same person at dinner for weeks and weeks on end, and by the end of it, you will either sort of uh, be on, not on speaking terms or having an affair. But luckily, <laughs> um, we, we, we you know we did have this amazing insight into, into uh, real, real Romanians and what they were like. It made an immense difference. Yeah. So your husband got, uh, negotiated to get George out of Romania. So what happened sort of, what happened to George? Where did he end up? Well, um, it wasn't only, only Martin, it wasn't only, only my husband. It was, um, no. but I have no idea what went on because it was all, in, uh, nothing was, I was told, wasn't told anything. Um, they left just before Christmas at the end of 1969 and I remember them going in a great rush. It was a snowstorm, and it, mm. it was dramatic, and they seemed to be late, and they came anyway. And uh, they went to London, came to London. And um, on my wall, I've got a, a picture of the square in Kensington where they were put up by, some, um, by, by MI6 in some uh, flat which belonged to them or something. And they, they were there for a bit, and then we, came, we were at home, and we saw a bit of them, mm. and um, then then we were sent off to Malawi. Uh, contrast, and um, and by the time we came back, they had um, decided they they had managed to move to Paris because they they spoke French, and it's easy by this Gigi by this time was um, in his sixties, I think, or nearly, and, and he, you know he was Frank, he was francophone. His English was he he spoke English, but very with an effort. So they went to Paris. And they lived in a little flat in the Rue de Vaugirard. And whenever we were in Europe or England, we used to see them. But of course, yeah. we spent long time abroad after that. So um, we, we, you know, we. It wasn't until Martin retired we, that, that that we saw them properly again. Well, we did see yeah, them, yeah. but not not very often. What did George sort of get up to in Paris? Was he now back in the arts and things? Or oh, absolutely. But well, he, he he was. Um, uh, he was painting, and he, mm. he 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 took himself very seriously as a painter, and he yes. was um, um, he was disappointed that he never got into the Paris art world properly, never never really accepted seriously, and um, mm. if he'd stayed in Romania, I think he would have had a much better career as an artist, uh, because yes. 
that he was already, we went one evening in, in Bucharest, one evening we had dinner with him at the artist club and he wouldn't have been allowed there if he had been, uh, unless he had been accepted, if you see what I mean. So I think in Romania, his, his art was taken much more seriously. Whereas in London, uh, in Paris rather, um, he, he never, he, he sold a bit, he, particularly in Germany. He went to Germany, he did some various things about um, his, his career. He was very disappointed, very, very disappointed. And, yeah. and Fraga, his wife, had a job in, in, uh, in publishing and she, she did, she adapted much better, really. Hmm. Mm. And is this what led to? What was it that led to the writing of his biography? Oh well, wouldn't wouldn't you want to write it? <laughs> of course you would. Yeah, yeah. Was that? Was that? Did he? Was there a particular impetus that sort of led him to starting it, or was it just something that over time he felt he should do? Not over the time, I think. Um, of course, he wrote it. Um, he started writing it quite. I can't remember the exact date, but it was quite soon after they had gone to Paris that he started to yes. write write down the story of his life. Which was, um, uh, um, I mean, writing. I think he writes beautifully, absolutely beautifully, um, and he he writes um, with um, the eye, the pen of, of an artist. His descriptions of the, uh, the 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 bright morning of of, of that moment in Ukraine. It, it's so beautiful. He, he's an absolute artist at bringing bringing a place to life, and you're making you see it through his eyes. Um, and it's it, he's a very good writer, and um, and I like I respond to writing which um, makes you see what's happening. Yeah, yeah, well, he's, he's, he's incredibly well written, and um, no, I think it's an excellent read. What is sort of George's legacy? How is he remembered today? Is he remembered today, or is he sort of forgotten? If you look on Romanian websites, you will see that, that, that there is a version. You know, the, the, his his um, his book has been published there as well in Romanian. Um, it was. He gave it to us, I think I said, it was only a few months, as it happened, only a few months before he died. And yes. um, we, we, we took it, he, he sent it to us, and I, I, um, I was working at the time, but I, I tried translating bits of it, making a synopsis, and sending it to various publishers, but I didn't have any success. And because I was so busy, um, I put it away and um, d- didn't... Um, and then it was a um, an article by, by Timothy Gar- Timothy Gar- Garthnash, and he 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 wrote something about going and looking up his um, the, the files that the Stasi had on, on him in Germany when he was there, and that that made me wonder what what the files of the Securitate might have had on Martin and me, which are plenty there, I'm mm. sure. Um, and, but that made me go and look at the manuscript again, and instead of just translating bits, I looked at the whole, and it needed a great deal of editing as well as uh, translation, because it was not always in the sort of... Uh, I had to move, move bits about quite a bit. And um, but so, um, and, and I, um, I was just amazed at the, what I had in front of me. It was so, so powerful and so coherent and so brilliantly recorded um, that I kept on. Yeah, well, no, it was well worth it. So, you know, well yeah. done for doing yeah. that. And I, I published it myself... Uh, um, in 2015, one of my granddaughters helped me to to do it, and um, but um, as a witness, but I didn't have any kind of um, access to publicity. There was a very big launch for it. In the, the Romanians have a, a cultural um, place in mm. Belgrade Square. And we had a huge launch party in Belgrade Square, and I sold quite a lot. But I didn't have any kind of links to. Um, and anything else. I love writing. And um, I decided to get somebody to publish it for me, this man, Envelope Books. Um, uh, and um, he, um, Stephen Games, and he ferreted around and he found the witness. And it was he who said this ought to be published again. So that's mm. how it's happening this time. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic, and it's been retitled, obviously now. Spy artist, that's right. Yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. And sorry, what was the original title again? The witness. The witness. The so witness. it was called the witness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Well, Jane, thank you so much for your time today. Now, before we part company, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? Any kind of like final thoughts or anything that's sort of relevant that we may have missed? He was very amazed, happy to be in Paris, but disappointed that his art was not appreciated. Um, which mm. I mean, it's. It's na- was naive of him in a way to think that um, 
the French art establishment would, would sort of rush out and greet him. Um, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, no, sad, isn't it, in some ways, because um, especially for some of the sort of, um, you know, sort of his activities during the war and stuff, it's a shame those sort of things don't tend to count when it comes to appreciation of your art. And Quite, things. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a hard, yeah. it's a hard-headed market. Um, it is indeed, it is indeed, like, like the film business is. <laughs> like like, like, <laughs> it's, like, it's like, like the book business too, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, right. exactly. <laughs> uh, well, um, where can listeners sort of find out more about you and, and the book? If you look on um, Finding Amazon, uh, yes. and, and my book about my childhood is, is Nell, Nora, Jane. Nell, Nora was a horrid aunt, Yeah. and Jane is me. Okay. okay. And that, that tells you my background. And apart from that, um, uh, I've done all, so many different things. Um, but um, I believe it's is it envelopebooks.co.uk are the publisher, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you can find the book there. Mm. Yeah, and brilliant. and on Amazon and, and sort of various other things. Excellent, excellent. Well, Jane, thank you so much for joining me today. Not, not a bit. Okay, fine. Thanks for listening. This is Secrets and Spies.